Hey everyone, this is Erica Lucas, your host and founding member of VEST, an organization connecting women across industries, regions, and career levels, so that together we can expedite the pipeline of more women in positions of power and influence. Welcome to another episode of the Vester Podcast, where we explore the invisible barriers holding women back in the workplace and share stories of women building power collectively. All of the publicly available data around women's health, we condense it and using data visualizations and summaries and comparisons so people have a quick place to come and find that. So that's part of that democratizing data. You shouldn't have to have letters after your name to understand the information that impacts your everyday health. We track things all the way from women's pay gaps to broadband access in our rural communities, access to safe and affordable housing, environmental justice. And so that's also part of that kind of broadening the conversation around women's health and showing that um, yes, environmental justice is reproductive justice. Um, living in a safe community is reproductive justice. Um, it's more than just our bodies. It's much broader than that. It touches upon budgets and sex ed and everything. This wasn't undone in a short amount of time. And so it's going to take time to improve, but we can't stop speaking out and we can't stop leaning into some of those difficult conversations. Hey everyone, this is Gabby Eichenlob, COO of VEST and your host for today's podcast episode, where we discussed all things women's health with Jacqueline Blocker, the data and policy director at Metriarch, an Oklahoma women's public health think tank that aims to normalize and broaden women's health conversations through data storytelling, policy evaluation, and interactive outreach events. We discussed everything from the social determinants impacting women's health to the role providers, employers, and individuals play in advocating for women's health and well-being. This episode is sponsored by Audible, the leading provider of audiobooks, podcasts, guided wellness programs, and more. So if you're looking for a book on how to level up at work or any other subject, Audible has over 1,000 titles for you to choose from. Head over to www.audibletrial.com forward slash best her and get a 30 day free trial plus a free credit to use on the book of your choice. To access our guest's full bio and for show notes, go to www.vesther.co forward slash podcast. This recording was part of a more intimate coaching session with VEST members and has been repurposed to accommodate this episode. Always excited to brag about the work that Metriarch is doing. Um, I joined Take Control Initiative as the Director of Data and Policy a little over a year and a half ago. And Metriarch is the data and policy arm of Take Control Initiative. Um, it was a pilot program that was um, that's incubated within Take Control Initiative. So Metriarch is a statewide women's public health think tank. And so that's kind of how the infrastructure works out. So I'm heading up Metriarch, but then we're the data and policy arm. And it grew out of uh, a need that our community partners realized that um, not only is women's health uh, data hard to find, once you find it, it's hard to understand it. So, um, and most of our direct service partners don't have the bandwidth to even track this or to verify um, what is correct information. Is this the right data point? Oftentimes it's comparing cherries to oranges. So um, that's what Metriarch does. That's the value that we add for our community partners as um, all of the publicly available data around women's health, we condense it and using data visualizations and summaries and comparisons. So people have a quick place to come and find that. So that's part of that democratizing data. You shouldn't have to have letters after your name to understand the information that impacts your everyday health. And so it's like that whole idea of making sure that knowledge isn't locked up, making sure that knowledge isn't in the echo chamber, um, that we're just not talking to one another about all of these data points. So, um, and then what's really kicked off since I've joined in the last year and a half is being able to take this data and use it to implement and impact um, smart policy around women's health. So we really become that trusted resource for lawmakers um, and for organizations that are trying to sponsor bills or stop bad bills. 
um, that trusted resource for what is good policy in the area of women's health. And so we're really unique in that regard. And what's really special about Metriarch and what I really love about it, which is kind of like the perfect culmination of all of my windy career goals and everything to get here, is that we don't just focus on bodily health, but we focus on the social determinants that impact um, women's health. So we're able to connect those dots and show all the intersectionality of all of the issues. And so really what's hardest for us is, is not having mission drift, because when you look at it in that way, um, all policy is public health policy. And so that's what becomes harder for us. Um, before I started, Metriarch was tracking approximately 40 bills. This year, we started tracking over 80 bills. So just in that three-year span, it's, over, it's doubled the number of bills that impact women's health. And so like we track things all the way from women's pay gaps to broadband access in the rural communities, um, safe and access to safe and affordable housing, um, environmental justice. And so that's also part of that kind of broadening the conversation around women's health and showing that, um, yes, environmental justice is reproductive justice. Um, living in a safe community is reproductive justice. Um, it's more than just our bodies. It's much broader than that. It touches upon budgets and sex ed and everything. So. Um, as you can tell, I really am proud of the work that we're doing. Um, I'm proud of the fact that we're able to kind of get a seat at the table where other groups and organizations might not get seats at some of the tables that are kind of impacting the policy. Um, so um, yeah, it's just really good work. Um, and it's all about, like I said, broadening and normalizing the conversation um, around women's health and democratizing data, making sure everyone has access to it, all the way from stakeholders to individuals advocating for themselves um, in the clinical setting. It all factors into it. I know we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. would love to hear from you. What are some of the most significant health issues facing women in the U.S. today? There is a plethora of them. Um, I'll hit some of the high. I think that one of the biggest um, health issues is the high rates of uninsurance for women um, nationally. Um, and particularly in Oklahoma, um, the percentage of women um, 19 to 44 um, not covered by public health is, um, the national average is around 12%, and Oklahoma is closer to 22%. We rank 49th for uninsured women. So I think that that alone is, I mean, even with insurance, um, healthcare, adequate healthcare is expensive. So for those without insurance, um, that prevents them from going to get more preventative care, um, for them seeking uh, the treatments that they need, um, for pregnant individuals not getting um, the prenatal care that they need. Um, so it has a huge impact um, on the outcomes, the health outcomes. Um, another um, barrier and problem with the health issues is a higher rate of poverty for women. Um, Oklahoma ranks 51st for women. Um, so as they keep adding states, we'll just keep going lower and lower. So, you know, all of those things are um, health and access to health care are those kind of factors that they determine when they're ranking states for women. So we're currently 51st. And part of that is we have a higher poverty level for a women in our state. Um, unfortunately, there is limited access to services. Um, we have um, and especially in our rural communities, um, we have healthcare deserts. And then um, we have doctors that are leaving the state. We already were kind of strapped for doctors, but doctors are now starting to leave the state. And we don't have enough mental health services and um, enough OBGYNs in, per capita. So that's a concern. And then it's also a deeper concern we have a lack of doctors and there's a lack of diversity of doctors, which also shows that's a factor in people seeking out health care and feeling like um, being heard. And sometimes it is more comfortable when there's someone that is more like you, at least somewhere in the, in the um, in that clinical setting. Um, and then also there's some stigma and discrimination um, around health care. And so that's something that I think we all can do better um, as a community and educating one another so that we can overcome those barriers to help providers be able to provide the care that they want to for their um, for their patients. And um, 
you know, one thing that we're very careful to do is not to like demonize or stigmatize any providers because I think it's incumbent upon all of us to do better about learning how to get through some of those um, stigmas and barriers. But then again, that's why it's kind of important to have more um, diversity too in some of our healthcare providers to kind of help navigate some of those communications. So um, those are some of them. Um, obviously, reproductive rights obviously is the big, um, um, the lack of access to care and the chilling effect that that's having um, on a lot of doctors. Um, I know in our state, when the laws first came out, um, doctors were scared to even provide mis miscarriage management for fear of criminal prosecution. And so that is, you know, that's going to worsen our health outcomes for women um, because people might be scared to seek care. Providers are scared to deliver care because they're not sure. Um, so that's having a chilling effect all around on people seeking the care that they need and providers being able to provide the care that they need. Um, so just kind of understanding those long and short term implications. And then, of course, our maternal health, um, Oklahoma ranks fourth for our maternal, maternal mortality rates. We've been consistently low in those areas. Um, and so trying to make sure that we are being very intentional about trying to close some of those gaps because it's over three times worse for BIPOC women with mortal, maternal mortality rates. Um, so we see the data, we have information, and we still gotta find better ways and solutions to try and attack that. Um, and what's becoming harder is we're becoming increasingly more dependent on NGOs to do this work. So I think we've got to find a way to try and make have more like corporate to nonprofit, maybe partnerships to help support because it's putting a lot of pressure on NGOs. It's putting more pressure on our providers and it's just not sustainable um, if we want to really turn the tide on improved outcomes in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma and nationwide. Um, the U.S. overall ranks very low for um, maternal mortality rates. And so Oklahoma just is the worst of the worst currently. There's a lot to tackle there. And I'm I'm glad that you guys are seeing those numbers and the data and, and all the data points for um, not just some of the traditional things that people associate with women's health, but just tackling it from all angles um, and just really seeing the implications of those, you know, the trickle down effects of these policies that are coming out. Would love to know also, um, I think you could say overall, we've had, there's been some great strides in healthcare and, and access to healthcare, um, but also just in this past decade, I don't know if it's just me or, you know, just the headlines that are out there, but would love to know from your standpoint, how access to healthcare has changed for women over the past decade and, and what impact this has had on all those, the, the outcomes and, and the, the factors that you just mentioned as well. Um, yes, well, the Affordable Care Act that was passed in 2010 um, definitely expanded um, and improved um, the uninsured rate. Not, I don't think it, it got worse again in 2019, unfortunately, but it did improve because it provided for Medicaid expansion in states. So that definitely helped. Um, it required um, insurance companies to start covering more preventative services, such as mammograms and pap smears. So just being able to um, have that preventative care for more women, that did help. And then it allowed for states to extend pregnancy coverage under Medicaid. Um, so that was very key in making sure that women were getting that. So that was a great expansion. Um, you know, in 2018, Oklahoma um, put the, to the vote of the people to expand Medicaid in Oklahoma. So we did have the Medicaid expansion, but up until January of 2023, just this year, um, Oklahoma was the lowest, one of the four lowest states for the federal poverty level. Federal poverty level. We were at 138%. So that wasn't really covering um, enough of the women to make a significant difference. Um, so Metriarch was able to actually work directly with the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority and bring some other stakeholders to the table and get that raised. Uh, we, make, we took some of the information. Um, they were able to present that to the Help Task Force, the Governor's Help Task Force, and they signed off unanimously to raise our federal poverty level to 205% and to extend postpartum from 60 days to 12 months. Um, so all of that was made available um, because of the Affordable Care Act 
Um, so all of those um, allowances were made for us to be able to make those changes. So I'm really proud that Metriarch was able to um, facilitate that and get that change done in real time. And it went into effect, like I said, January of 2023. So that's already impacting so many um, pregnant people. And so that's really good news to be able to have that. And then um, we also are able to work with the um, healthcare authority in getting doula reimbursements under Medicaid and to kind of expand the number of doula certifications that are acknowledged by that. So that will go into effect in June of 2023. So um, yes, there have been there have been some improvements. Like that is really a wonderful thing that we're going to get more people covered and get that kind of extended uh, pregnancy coverage. I think that's going to improve our health outcomes. There are some challenges still. Um, like there's still some challenges with Title X funding coming in, and some concerns that um, the state might be able to maintain some of that funding because um, because of our state laws, we're unable to comply with some of the federal requirements around family planning. So while there is really good news, I um, it's hard for me not to also balance out that there's still some very concerning things out here that could really directly impact those that are trying to provide services to people on the ground. Um, and then again, with the restrictive access, um, and it's some of our a lot of our doctors are leaving the state, and that's just a dire concern um, for making sure that people have access to it. So while we have all these expansions that will allow more people to get access, I'm concerned there's not going to be enough resources and providers here for them to get the um, to get the care that they actually have eligibility for. So those are kind of how the things balance out. Um, telehealth has improved because of COVID, so that has helped out a lot with some of the rule. Um, access and so that broadband access being increased um, combined with telehealth. So that is one thing that um, I think was kind of a positive outcome, if you want to say, from the pandemic is that more reliance on telehealth that help people access more mental health. And then for those, like I said, in our rural communities that have a harder time um, traveling. So that has helped. But again, the concern is, are there enough providers to give the care to those that are seeking it? It's um, interesting how it all plays in together. One one aspect of the um, healthcare sector or uh, affects another part as well. You kind of mentioned it earlier as well, um, and we've been hearing about it more and more. But we we know that there um, that factors like race, socioeconomic status, geographic location do affect um, women's uh, women's health outcomes. Um, but would love to know just um, a little bit more about that, if you can expand on that and just more on the disparities in, in that healthcare access and outcome. One of the images I feel like is the most compelling when we're talking about some of the health disparities um, and health outcomes is there are studies that show that um, a white woman with an eighth grade education is more likely to have a healthy birth than um, a black woman with a PhD or an advanced degree. So um, oftentimes you want to always loop um, the BIPOC women in with poverty, but what the data shows is that doesn't matter with the income or education when it comes to health outcomes. So there's something else going on there that we have to take a a look at because it's clearly not just the economic or the so it's something else that's going on. So um, I think that education, like I said, all around for um, providers and patients to be kind of aware of some of these um, unintentional biases that we all are socialized to have and understanding. Um, like when I talk to some of the pre-med students, you know, I'm like, you have to think about the difference between race and ethnicity, because the ethnicity is what impacts truly um, the health outcomes. The race is the social construct, which still we have to track that data because the perception of if there's distrust, then your patient isn't giving you the information that you need to properly treat the patient. So, um, you know, it's kind of that two-way street of making sure that, like I said, providers don't feel attacked because it's not all on the providers, but also it's not, can't always be incumbent on the patients either. So it has to be like working in community to understand these biases do exist. So how do we um, get around these things? It's also um, 
reminding everyone, like all of those annoying boxes that we have to tick when we're filling out everything, understanding why they're important, because that's the data that we use to track health outcomes, to try and improve the policy. So as annoying as all of those boxes are, they're there for a reason. And so we do need that data and that information to make sure that policy is going in the right direction to impact the right things and that providers are aware of certain trends so that they can also um, adjust as well and clinicians. And so um, I think that's important. I think it's important to recognize that there are some cultural differences. Um, there are sometimes language barriers. Everything around the vaccine pointed out a lot of that as well, some of those cultural biases. So I think not being afraid to talk about those biases so that we can figure out a way to make sure that patients are getting, like I said, the treatment that they need and providers are getting information they need to properly be able to um, provide that. Unfortunately, the vicious cycle of poverty is another barrier to accessing healthcare. Um, even women who are insured sometimes don't seek the care that they need um, because of the, of the cost. And so um, that's why the pay gap is significant. Um, we have to still address that. Women are still making 82% 82 cents to a dollar for men, and then it's 63 for BIPOC women. So um, that impacts health. And so thinking about that, um, teaching women how to not be afraid to negotiate for a higher salary, um, and as women in leadership, making sure that we are adjusting our salaries um, adequately to match what male counterparts are making. So those are the things that we can do. And then maybe finding ways to get businesses to put pressure on some of the insurance companies to see, can we get better rates um, to help our employees out here and not strap the employer with higher rates to help out their employees. So um, I feel like there's ways that we can all kind of work together to help this and, um, and show like the business impact of it sometimes. Um, I think that helps in these conversations. Um, as far as geographic location, Oklahoma, um, there's 41 out of our 77 Oklahoma counties that are considered maternity healthcare deserts. And like I said, those numbers are getting worse. 18% of Oklahoma women were unable to see a doctor in 2019 due to cost. And that was regardless of whether or not they had insurance. And then 30% of Oklahomans reported having unpaid medical debt. And so we are eighth um, most indebted in the nation with regard to um, med unpaid medical debt. So those are other barriers to people seeking the care that they need. Um, if you have to choose between putting food on the table and seeking preventative care, you're going to choose that. So um, the pay gap does play into all of that. All of it's interconnected, um, you know, access to safe and affordable housing. Um, you know, we had to add safe to it because affordable is one thing, but is it safe and livable? Um, housing. And that's become more difficult in Oklahoma to find safe and affordable housing. So um, access to parks, access to clean water, um, all of these things are interconnected. And so I feel like no matter what sector we work in, we could play a role in actually um, improving health um, outcomes and for not just Oklahomans, for um, women around the nation. We're kind of talking about policy and, and how, you know, how all this kind of affects what's going on currently with the current political environment what role do healthcare providers and institutions play in promoting women's health um i know you mentioned a couple just just in what you were just saying um what areas do you think um would you recommend or, or improvements be made i feel for our providers right now they're kind of in um a difficult situation because many want to speak out but like i know of some doctors that are receiving um threats of violence and, you know, there's um, state funding that they have to consider with their institutions. So, I mean, the best place that doctors could speak out is making sure that the bills that are being passed are dictating how they're having to provide care are actually um, based on some medical facts. And because it is impacting the way that they are going to be able to provide care to their patients. So, trying to find a way to um, <clears throat> speak to lawmakers without it being politicized and just saying these are the facts and this is how it's impacting the way that we do it. Because the way I see it is these doctors spent a lot of time and money to go to med school to get this expertise. And now someone without that expertise is dictating how they provide care. 
um, that's troubling if they haven't actually consulted with the experts in those particular areas. So lawmakers are people too. They are just chose to become elected officials. And so trying to maybe um, demystify that and just make doctors feel more comfortable reaching out to their lawmakers and explaining why certain things need to be left to the doctors to decide. And then truly do getting more, getting more involved in knowing the bills that are impacting um, the way that some of the businesses are able to provide care because, um, you know, there are bills that are telling insurance companies what they can and cannot reimburse. And so that impacts the way that business is going to be done. So I do think that and that's why Metriarch is here as a resource because everyone can't keep up with all of that, don't have the bandwidth to do so. So I think that that would be um, super helpful. And I think also um, when doctors can have the town halls to maybe focus specifically on women's health issues and talk about that and having that kind of space to discuss those things, I think that's helpful as well. Um, and then playing a role in protecting access to uh, patient data. I think that privacy is going to be a really key issue now um, coming up for protecting our patients' um, access. So I think the doctors being kind of proactive and making sure that they're um, able to protect um, provider um, information and protecting access to um, patient data, I think is going to be very critical. Jacqueline would also love to know um, if there are um, public policies or programs that have been particularly effective in improving women's health outcomes, whether here in Oklahoma um, or you know throughout the U.S. that you've noticed. I will brag again on um, the work that Metriarch did with the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority and getting the pregnancy extension under Medicaid and getting that federal poverty level increased to 205 percent, um, and then the postpartum care extended to 12 months, and then the doula reimbursements that will uh, go into effect in June. Um, we continue to um, meet with the healthcare authority on a regular basis to make sure that the implementation is um, going smoothly and to make sure that we're catching any gaps in enrollment. So continuing to have that conversation and um, the healthcare authority wanting to get the expertise of those working in women's health is um, a really positive um, for uh, our state. And I think uh, will be modeled by other states. Um, the I think the health departments will start kind of relying more on working with the experts to try and get this policy through. And I think it's just, um, it's a smoother transition because we have the data and they can plug it in and they know how the system works. So that's a really positive sign. Um, in Oklahoma, currently there are two bills that are seeking to confirm access to contraception. And so I think that's a positive for um, all of uh, those in our state because uh, there was some concern that, you know, maybe that would be impacted, but um, the lawmakers have made it clear that they when they still have the voters that they want to make sure that there's still access to that. So that's a positive, I feel, for Oklahoma as well. Um, but there's still a lot of challenges. I think the main thing is we have to make sure that people are well educated about um, access and resources. There are resources, but oftentimes people aren't aware of them and um, not aware of the eligibility requirements. So I think that that is um, one thing that we could all do better about is about educating people about resources. But we have a lot of work to do. Like I said, we're, we're 51st for women. Um, we're at the bottom 10 for a lot for women, but women alone can't fix it. We can do a lot, but I think it's... Um, it's incumbent upon us to educate how, like you said, all this is interconnected and it impacts everything. It, it impacts our overall ranking as a state. It impacts workforce recruitment and retention. Um, it impacts companies wanting to bring their um, their work in their um, bring their work here. Um, so, if we want to continue to recruit and maintain the best and the brightest in our state, I think it's incumbent upon us to recognize the significant impact that women's health does have on our overall economy. And as amazing all of us are, <laughs> it can't be incumbent on only us to fix it, but I do think we have the power to make a huge shift and a change. 
if we find ways to collaborate. Um, like I'm really big on the private and the non-for-profit um, partnerships and finding ways to kind of leverage that um, while making sure that we can keep people safe. Like for example, Metriarch right now is spearheading an economic development and health coalition. And it's focusing on the impact that some of the restrictive bills are having on workforce development. So making sure that um, people understand that businesses are concerned about this and giving them that safe space to talk about it without having to be on the front lines of um, putting necessarily um, a name and a face to it, but being able to put that support behind knowing that this is impacting our workforce and our ability to recruit and retain um, talent. So um, just have to try from all angles because it is impacting all angles. I was gonna ask you how women can take an active role um, and advocating for their own health, but also uh, added to that, how how can we kind of get in everyone else that kind of needs to be involved in these conversations? Um, any any kind of tips or um, resources aside from Metriarch? Because um, it seems like Metriarch has a lot of resources that we can each tap into, but would love to hear um, from that angle as well. Well, absolutely sign up for our weekly newsletter, Fierce Facts. It comes out every Monday. Um, that's uh, chocked full of great resources. Um, during the session, we summarize um, the bills that um, are of note that passed that week. And then um, during session, Metriarch also hosts a Friday uh, weekly legislative clearinghouse call. It's 30 minutes. It's open to all that are interested in learning about women's health. And we quickly summarize the bills that um, have passed that week that we are tracking or that community partners have requested that we review. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, the newly formed um, EDHC, Economic Development and Health Coalition, um, it is a grass tops coalition and seeking um, those businesses and business owners and that are interested in making sure that we're maintaining a strong workforce um, and noting the impact it's having on recruitment and retention. And so, um, and specifically the coalition is to um, protect access to sex ed and contraception, noting that um, a lot of these organizations were created um, to help address the teen pregnancy rate that spiked a few decades. It had a significant um, impact on that. And so now the fear is taking away some of these things that have chosen to work will hurt um, our economic um, status. It will hurt women specifically. So that's the um, position that this coalition is taking to have businesses who have committed to wanting to make sure that we have a strong women workforce, kind of lending their support to this work that we're doing to make sure that we protect access to that, to make sure we keep our doctors in our state. You know, we have residents that are turning down their acceptances here because they feel like they can't get a full um, education or experience here in Oklahoma. We can't, uh, we, that's just not sustainable for us to, to lose um, medical um, providers in our state. It's, our providers are already overwhelmed. We just can't stand to, to lose anymore. So I would love for you all as business um, owners to participate in e, a DHC. You can just stay in the loop via emails, you can join meetings or you can add to um, letters of support as they go out or share social media. It's um, all up to you, the level of involvement that you wanna be in. But I would encourage you at the very least to stay in the loop and know what's going on. And um, if it's in your wheelhouse, whether professionally or personally, reach out to the lawmakers and let them know that this is something that's important to me. Um, constituents do have sway. And um, if they get enough messages about something, then it will impact them. But, you know, it's going to take some time. This is not, it didn't, this wasn't undone in a short amount of time. And so it's going to take time to improve, but we can't stop um, speaking out and we can't stop leaning into some of those difficult conversations. You know, whether it's health uh, access or really any other topic that affects women or, or the public in general, just reaching out to legislators and knowing, you know, how it'll affect us is important to let them know. Um, sometimes it may feel like they're not listening, but if enough of us call, then they, they have no choice but to listen. Um, and I know Caitlin also shared in the chat um, 
uh, Metriarch's Guide to Contacting Legislators. Is that something that has like a, a script for people to use? To some degree, like it's, it's more open-ended, like just kind of gives you, here's what to expect, here are the different ways you can do it, here's what that conversation might look like, and here's how to prepare for it. Lawmakers are more receptive. They recognize those copy and paste messages. So when it's more personal, um, it, it resonates more. That's why we purposely leave it open-ended. They're more likely to dismiss the copy and paste emails or, or the messages. Definitely good to know. Looking to the future, what are the most pressing issues that women face, women's health is facing um, that still need to be addressed? I, I know we've, we've covered quite a, a broad variety of topics, um, but would love to know some of those that maybe aren't getting as much attention um, as they should be, and then just what steps we can make to progress on those issues. I've covered so many. Um, Paid leave, I think, is really the biggest issue um, and the biggest problem. Um, child care expenses for those that um, already have children. And, you know, one of the ripple effects of that is for those who can't afford child care, the extra pressure that puts on family members or extended family to help out with that. So um, that does have that ripple effect of it. And it causes people to have to alter what they might be doing because of the cost of child care workplace harassment and discrimination. Um, there are some bills that risk um, being able to adequately pursue those kind of cases. I've mentioned it before, but continuing to try and find ways to grow and diversify the um, perinatal workforce is something that's really important. And then I just think really continued education. Um, what I've found as I'm doing this work more is we're just not well educated around so many of the issues that impact our health. And so I think providing more spaces like this to talk about it candidly and have more resources to it, I think is really um, important. And then, you know, like I said, speak up to lawmakers. They're just people that decided to run for office. There's nothing magical about them. We have to continue to vote. We have such a powerful voting block, and I know everyone keeps saying that, but we are like Oklahoma ranks 48th for voter participation, which is really bad. Um, but women, obviously, we show up in higher numbers, so we just we've got to um, just make sure we get more people engaged and have them understand why all of this matters. Um, I feel like now even more so, people feel disconnected and don't think that anything they're going to do makes a difference, and it's having a chilling effect. And so there's no accountability for things that are being done and it's just not sustainable to do that. So um, I mean, I have a whole list of things that people could do. I don't want to overwhelm people. I think the biggest thing is don't become overwhelmed. Find that one thing that you, that resonates with you and that you can um, maybe have an impact on and focus on that. It's like, don't get overwhelmed by so many of the things because if you do that, then it's, um, it's like paralysis, right? And so just find that one thing you can do and know that that one thing is going to make a significant impact. I think that's probably um, the biggest thing. You can't, we can't fix all things, but I guarantee that everyone on here um, has the power to probably impact one particular issue that resonates with you. And so that's what I would encourage you to do is focus on that and then find a way through your networks or your own um, experience to do that. And if you don't know where to start, reach out to us. Uh, we can probably point you in the right direction. <laughs> Thank you, Jacqueline. Yeah, great, great takeaways. Ladies, I want to open it up to questions that you all may have. Um, any questions, comments, whether it's a certain issue that we talked about, um, whether it's an issue you're facing, um, please, this, the floor is yours. Eliane? I see it happen often where um, people that come to the state with asylum um, that the social security hasn't been assigned. So there is a period of like six months um, of having like zero access to healthcare. Um, we've been sending them to community health connection, which is a local clinic um, here in Tulsa, where they, you can just do a letter uh, of income um, that you need to be notarized and then they will adjust the bill uh, to it. Um, interesting enough, they, they, they see healthcare, um, and a couple of times, uh, they need to get a mammograms and it's a process. I'm, I'm going to just say it really quick, but I'm just like, when I finish what, what I want to know is how we can improve this loan process. We provide, you know, we just make the connection, they prove the income, 
then they get the, the voucher, they get the free mammogram. I think it's um, the next step, if the mammogram, they have to get a biopsy, that's where we stop, like the assistant stop. It's a long process. I don't know what are we doing to communicate. This is, I am not uh, on the health industry. I'm like, what are we doing to communicate? What are the resources that we have, you know? Um, and then is there any other possible way before you get your social security, or even if you're undocumented to obtain medical um, or health assistance? I'm not complaining. I'm just... No, no, no. What you just identified is um, enough that's a barrier to women's health because if there's not someone to keep walking someone through that step, they'll stop at that critical moment because there's so much more going on. So having to go through all of that steps is difficult. So um, I think that there's probably a way maybe that we could find ways to streamline the problem. Like let people know ahead of time, at least the steps they're going to have to go through. Like maybe that's something that we could create some kind of social media around and then you could share it with your network so that people would have that. But the first thing when you start talking, I know Representative Provenzano last year ran a bill specific to how mammograms are um, reimbursed under insurance because there was some way of the coding that was um, difficult. So I'm also wondering if there's a way to, and that bill sail through without, um, without fail. And if there's some way to talk to her during the off season and see if there's a way to amend or add something to that bill that might provide additional. I'll be very transparent in Oklahoma and the current staff, sometimes it's difficult for the, for the undocumented um, healthcare coverage, just being transparent. But since that bill already exists and it's so specific to mammograms and biopsies, there might be a way to, to expand on that. I think it's worth the conversation. Yes, I would love to connect with you offline so we can see where they can go with this. But this is how policy is created oftentimes, just like this, a bill is created just from this kind of conversations. Wow, and just a reminder, Jacqueline and Caitlin are best members as well. So they're on the app, so you guys can um, use there to, to communicate. Um, and yes, Monica um, also mentioned Oklahoma Project Women provides coupons and patients can go to a bunch of different locations and that is available statewide. Yeah. Vanessa, did you have a question? I did. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jacqueline and Caitlin. I really, really enjoyed this talk and hearing you all speak on the social determinants of health. And thank you, Gabby, for always just curating these wonderful conversations. I really enjoyed this. Um, but yes, I'm an urban planner. And so everything I do is centered on the physical environment and understanding how the physical environment is impacting people's quality of life. So I was really just nerding out when I heard you speak, Jacqueline, on social determinants of health and how you all are focusing in on those efforts here locally. I was wondering if you have time to maybe share a little bit more about what that looks like. And also, are you all focusing on specific geographic areas or neighborhoods? Like, how does that work with, with Metriarch? Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, you see, I nerd out about it too. I could talk about this stuff like all day. Um, we are not focusing on um, specific geographical areas. I think, honestly, that's something where we would rely on um, organizations such as yours for that information um, and that's where we would like to work collaboratively because we keep, we're not the experts on all things even though like the environmental justice is like a personal passion of mine um, I have to make sure that I am still addressing um, all of the determinants so no it is statewide that we're doing that um, when it's like for example some of the data focuses more on North Tulsa having certain um, issues as it relates to the rest of the state or the, um, of the city, then sometimes it will highlight that. But in an effort to make sure that we are being statewide, we haven't really focused uh, geographically on any areas. Um, and so for our data lookbook, we had 48 um, social determinants of health that we impacted. So it goes all the way from like broadband access to the number of parks um, in an area, um, like I said, access to affordable um, housing, how far it is from um, particular um, doors to a doctor's office. So those type of social determinants. But as we're looking at the data, obviously the pandemic impacted data, I'm honestly thinking that we're going to have to maybe adjust some of those data points that we're looking at. So um, I'm always open to suggestions if there's some things that we should be adding. Because for me now, I think clean water has to be another thing that we add to that. We have so many rural communities that have the 
the boil alerts that go into effect and and me understanding all of the water law things. It's hard for me not to focus on that sometimes. Um, I think the number of businesses and areas impacts all of that. So um, like I said, we're still technically a pilot program. So I'm 100% open to what other things we need to be focusing on. And if there are geographical areas that we should be focusing on um, or committing some time to, I would love to do that because we have our journal where we have policy papers. Um, we have op-eds that are authored. We'd love to have any of you all author an op-ed if there's something you're passionate about. Um, so happy to dive into um, any other social determinants that you think that we should be focused on. Awesome. I don't want to hijack the conversation, but I'll definitely connect with you. Um, there's a lot of work that we're doing here in the Oklahoma City metro area and uncovering a lot of those dynamics, I think would be interesting to have a conversation with you about. So I, I will definitely connect. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Um, we have one minute left, and I'd just quickly love to know just your one takeaway um, for uh, for us as VEST members, but also for women that may be hearing this on the podcast. Um, would love to know just your, your takeaway. Um, I guess my, my main takeaway is stay informed, know the health care and the policy that's impacting not only your business and your organization, but you personally, whether you're in the state or anywhere, like women's health overall isn't great nationally. Um, it's just particularly worse in Oklahoma. So know that policy. Don't be afraid to lean into the difficult conversations. Um, I think that's more critical now than ever. Don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. Um, I think we need more of this to find ways that we can cross collaborate. Vote, vote, vote on everything. Um, one of our policy tools is a ju judicial guide because people don't know the judges that make a huge impact on the policies that we have in place. One thing that I learned was that over 90% of our judges in Oklahoma are former DAs. There's nothing wrong with DAs, but that's not a balanced jurist. So we need to know information about every single elected official and the impact that they have um, on our overall policy. Um, so just staying engaged, staying in the know, um, but not getting overwhelmed and finding that one specific thing that maybe you can focus on with other people and see if you can address it. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and don't forget to leave us a review. And if you're ready to take your career to the next level, apply to join our community of professional women all eager to help you get there and stay there. Go to www.besther.co and apply today. 